Taking a look at the way too early 53-man roster projection, starting with the offensive side of the ball, this week on the Wandering Buffalo Podcast. You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo Podcast with your host, Justin Goddard. Bills Mafia, welcome to another episode of the Wandering Buffalo Podcast. My name is Justin. I will be your host today. Um, this show is on the Buffalo Fan Base Podcast Network. Um, tons of great shows out there. We're really trying to grow the network. So if you love this show, if this show is not for you, there's kind of something out there for everybody. So um, especially this time of year when, you know, there's just not a ton going on, you know, bills wise, just to kind of get other people's takes on what's going on with the team, where they think it's headed, you know, combine that with, you know, how others are feeling, how you're feeling, what you want to see happen, what your expectations are for the year. Uh, You know, from everything local to, if you go to a national perspective, you can get, you know, everywhere from the bills are going to win the Super Bowl to, the Bills are going to finish third in the division, fourth in, in the division. Um, so personally, I, I like to kind of take a, a broad spectrum approach to things when I'm forming my opinions. I have, you know, several different podcasts I listen to. Um, just a lot of stuff I follow to, to just kind of give me as much information on where the team stands um, as of now and you know, what we would want to see going forward, all things like that. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, obviously start off right from the top that this is a way too early, uh, 53 man roster projection. And the perfect evidence of that is it, this was intended to be, um, last week's episode, um, schedule release came out kind of wanted to get get to that one while it was timely um but had to go back through and redo some projections to a certain degree um just we add the linebacker Andreessen from UB um went to Cephas Cephas gets cut um so it was it's already you know in May we're already re-tinkering with what I did a week ago um not to mention, you know, come June first, we're freeing up the Trey White money. I'm sure some moves are going to happen there. Um, so I just kind of like to I have it done on a spreadsheet, and I just kind of tinker with it as as we go through the off season, and you know, get into training camps, and we get our little tidbits and of you know who's doing what in practice. Unfortunately, it seems like the better the team has gotten, the harder it is to get like videos from practice and stuff and kind of form my own opinions. It it, it kind of leans heavily on, you know, the people that are there and seeing things. Um, But then as we move through, you know, the preseason and it, it's kind of like, you know, do we want to carry this veteran that kind of establishes the floor more or, you know, a younger player that might have a higher ceiling but has some work to do to to get to that floor. Um, so this is just an exercise that I, I kind of keep going all throughout the offseason. And it, it's kind of playing with the numbers game of, you know, where could we add talent and lose somebody that wouldn't be a hard cut type deal? Um where are numbers at at each position? And then it's just like kind of constantly looking through um, what's on the roster and where we can make improvements. Um, So I will say this week I'm going to do the offensive side of the ball. Um, Next week will be the defensive side of the ball. And all the numbers add up. It'll get us to our 53. And this is going to kind of take me into my next exercise, um, which is going to be the positional review series that I'll do. Um, And it's just going to go through each position, some some of the positions that are easier. um, Quarterback, for example. Uh, I'm going to parlay that with another position group and just kind of 
give myself a more concrete idea of where each position stands, where I think it's going, where I think we could add something, you know, where maybe I would add something, but I don't see it as very realistic. Um, so without further ado, just going to jump in here. Um, I'm going to start at the quarterback position. Very cut and dry, very simple. Um, also should put the disclaimer out there. A ton of these guys are going to end up on the practice squad. Um, I'm not going to touch any practice squad projections for quite some time. That probably won't be until we start seeing some preseason games. This is just kind of you know, where I think the needs are, where players were picked in the draft, what kind of upside do they have, what kind of path they have to the roster. Um, we'll take the rest down the road. Uh, but starting with the quarterback position, I think this one's very cut and dry. Um, currently on the roster, we have Josh Allen, Mitch Trubisky, and Shane Bouchel. Um, I think Mitch Trubisky given the contract that he was given, um, you know, given the idea that with any injury, that quarterback's going to have to come in. I think he's a pretty easy lock for the QB2 position, and I have Shane Buchel being cut here. Um, I think Buchel offers some sort of, like, developmental upside, um, kind of got some tools to him, um, don't see him being the player that comes in, you know, if Josh Allen has to miss any sort of amount of time. For me, just looking at this first position, um, like comfort-wise going forward, it, it's a position that I've talked about for a long time. I And I, th I think we're maybe next year's the year that we're able to do it. Um, I'm interested in bringing in like a mid-round pick um, to kind of develop behind Josh Allen. Obviously, you're not looking for somebody to replace him, um, but just kind of have a cost-controlled high-end backup that, you know, if they're looking so good that you can't deny getting them on a field, now you have some trade bait. Um, and then rinse and repeat the process. Um, so that would be the first position. Pretty simple. One cut, Shane Bouchel. Um the running back position, I think, is also pretty cut and dry. I'm going to um, lump Reggie Gilliam in with the running backs here. Um, so as it stands now, James Cook, Ty Johnson, Ray Davis, Darrington Evans, Reggie Gilliam, and Frank Gore Jr. Um, and I have four running backs staying here in James Cook, Ty Johnson, Ray Davis, and Reggie Gilliam. And two cuts, and that would be Darrington Evans and Frank Gore Jr. Um, the the one kind of thing I could see swapping out here, it would be Ty Johnson for um, Frank Gore Jr., and I think that would be largely based on, you know, what we see come preseason, through training camps, all that. Um, and on, if I'm being honest, it's a lot to do with the name. It's a lot to do with, you know, that NFL bloodline, um, knowing, you know, who his father is, what he was able to do in the NFL, the habits that he's been around his whole life. Um, I think he's going to come in with some extra motivation and, you know, have the potential to make an impact on this team and, you know, it's not like there's a, a steep road to the roster for a guy like Frank Gore Jr. Um, we did just bring back Ty Johnson. It's a pretty minimal contract. I see this more as, you know, something that we would probably look at next year, next offseason. I see him on the practice squad, whatever, for this year. Um, but that's, if I had to pick one spot here that, would kind of be left up for debate for me. Um, I could see a path where it's, you know, Frank Gore over Ty Johnson. I don't think you're going to do anything with, you know, trying to sneak Ray Davis onto the practice squad or anything like that. Um, you have draft capital invested in him in this year. 
Um, and James Cook is very obviously going to be there. Um, so yeah, that's the running back room, the tight end room. Um, this one was about as easy as the quarterback room for me. Um, on the roster currently, Dalton Kincaid, Dawson Knox, Quinn Morris, Trey McKitty, and Zach Davidson. I have the Bills keeping Dalton Kincaid, Dawson Knox, and Quentin Morris. Um, cutting Trey McKitty and Zach Davidson. I think the two of them do have some developmental upside, but what you already have on the roster, um, I think you can swing Reggie Gilliam to play a little tight end. Um, like in a blocking capacity, we've seen that in the past. I. Uh, I think Quinn Morris is at probably the best tight end three in the league. I don't know how many people are having that kind of debate, um, but there were stretches where he was playing as tight end two, and I, I was pleased with what I saw. Um, and then there's you know some discussion out there surrounding Dawson Knox, um, and it's largely to do with you know he's got a pretty big contract and. A lot of people were pretty underwhelmed by him last year. I think just dealing with injuries that he had last year, yes, we've seen his struggles with drops in the past, um, but I think it's a bit of recency bias. I think he still has the ability to be a very impactful player on this team. And as your tight end, too, like with his blocking upside alone, um, and then what he brings to the passing game, I think he would be tight end one on a ton of teams. And the fact that we have Kincaid here and hoping he takes the next step and you have the luxury of Dawson Knox being your tight end too, um, I don't see him going anywhere. Um, I think you start factoring in contract details and everything with it. He's just a hard player to move. Uh, the whole Stefan Diggs situation taught me the to never say never um just kind of protect myself from that because I was very adamant that Stefan Diggs would not be moved and here we are um so very comfortable with that room and then moving into the receiver room this is where I struggled the most um I think the bills have just kind of they're just throwing a bunch of darts and kind of seems like they want to assemble uh, like a bunch of wide receiver twos and threes and just kind of spread the ball around. Um, I think if we, I think if the team was focused on getting kind of that absolute number one alpha replacing Stefan Diggs one for one, we would have seen the move up in the draft. Um, and maybe that's something that we'll see happen in the future, um, just with kind of cap space being cleared up and whatnot. Um, but for this season, I'm kind of getting the impression that it's going to be, you know, like a committee approach and, you know, come, come June 1st when that Trey White money's freed up. Maybe we see a pivot. Maybe we see Brandon Bean swing for the fences and try to get a trade done, something like that. Um, but with the numbers in the room right now, I I don't see that as very likely. Um, so currently on the roster, Curtis Samuel, Keon Coleman, Khalil Shakir, uh, Mac Hollins, Justin Shorter, Brian Thompson, Xavier Johnson, Chase Claypool, uh, Marquez Valdez Scantling, uh, KJ Hamler, Andy Isabella, Tyrell Shavers, and Lawrence Keys. And I have the Bills keeping Curtis Samuel, Keon Coleman, Khalil Shakir, Mac Hollins, MVS, and one of the two between KJ Hamler and Andy Isabella. Um, so I'll start there. I think KJ Hamler has the higher upside. Uh, but just given kind of his injury history, um, I kind of see the path for it being Andy Isabella. I prefer KJ Hamler here just because 
I feel like Andy Isabella's had plenty of chances um, to kind of like display his skill set. You know, he's he's been in wide receiver rooms that were hurting for talent and hasn't really been able to latch on and and you know solidify himself as a as a roster lock, um, even at like that wide receiver five or six position. Um, so I have Camler. St- I'm sorry, Hamler staying there. Um, And then some of these other guys, I think there's, I think there's immense competition for that wide receiver, you know, six range, depending on, you know, how many they they keep this year. I have, I will say, I, I think Matt Collins is far from a roster lock. I think he was brought in. I think there's, Plenty to tap into there with a better quarterback. I think he provides special teams. I think he provides leadership. Um, but it's not like, you know, he's an irreplaceable player. Um, so I, I have him kind of up for a debate depending on what happens with the rest of these guys. Um, Justin Shorter is somebody that a lot of fans have been clamoring to see. The last time we saw him in the preseason, he was a disaster on special teams. And I, I think that's a requisite for, you know, rounding out this room. Um, Some of these other guys have been floating around our practice squad for a while in, you know, Brian Thompson and Tyrell Shavers, and they've made some impacts, but haven't been able to kind of get over that hump. So is, is this the year that they're able to do that? We'll see what it's looking like um, throughout training camp. Um, Chase Claypool, I, I don't know. For me, this is kind of a, a, a personal decision um, versus anything else. Um, look, in, in an ordinary circumstance, I could get bringing in a guy like Claypool. You know, he's he's got the draft pedigree. He has, uh, like, proven success in the NFL. Um, he, he's been there, he's done it, and he's kind of fallen off. Um, fallen out of favor with a couple teams and in ordinary circumstances I'm all for you know that low risk high reward signing and you see if you can bring him into the building and get the best version of himself and if it doesn't work out whatever we cut him um personally I I wouldn't touched him he didn't even cross my mind um don't fully get bringing him in with everything I just said you know accounting for that um I just feel like where you're at as a team right now I don't think he's somebody that comes in and you know fits the culture that is so important in Buffalo um I don't think he's a team first kind of guy um you know we, we saw him back in the day talking about how he was not getting the respect he deserved basically and that he was a top three or five, whatever it was, receiver in the league. And he was, you know, barely a top three receiver on his team. Um, So maybe this is one that I have to eat crow and he comes in, he's, you know, highly motivated based on, you know, basically basically leaving the league and he was signed up to play for the CFL. Um, Maybe that's kind of like his reality check and I'm completely wrong here. The one that always sticks with me is he was still in Pittsburgh and, you know, they were running hurry up offense, two minute drill, and he got like this big first down and everybody else is scrambling to get back on the ball. And, you know, he's taking his time getting up and, celebrating and it's just that one has always stuck with me of like that that's some stuff that's like high school football right there you know like you got to get back on the ball you you hand the ball to the ref you go line up you don't toss the ball to the ref you get the ball reset as fast as possible and whether you're spiking it running the next play whatever you're getting on the ball as soon as possible and that one that one will always stick with me and bug me like I said Maybe he's coming in as a different player. For my personal taste, wouldn't have been where I made an investment 
no matter how small it is. Um, but I digress. Um, moving into the offensive line, and I think this is another one kind of similar to the wide receiver room for me. Um, I guess pretty different. There's just a lot of numbers involved here. Um, but currently on the roster, Deion Dawkins, David Edwards, Connor McGovern, Osiris Torrance, Spencer Brown, Ryan Vandemark, uh, Alec Anderson, Cedric Van Pen, Van Prengran. I'm I'm gonna continue messing that one up for a while. Um, Travis Clayton, Lyle Collins, Tylen Grable, Keaton Bills, Will Clapp, Kevin Jarvis, Tommy Doyle, Richard Richard Garage, Gunner Britton, and Mike Edwards. Um, so currently, I have the Bills keeping nine offensive linemen. Um, and just kind of how these numbers shake out. Pretty simple, because the starting five is staying very similar to last year, and that's Deion Dawkins, um, Connor McGovern, Osiris Torrance, Spencer Brown. Obviously, the change here as of right now, I would say, is David Edwards um, stepping in and Connor McGovern kicking over to center. Um, and then I have Ryan Vandemark, Alec Anderson, um, Cedric VPG, we'll call him that, and Lyle Collins as your depth guys here. Um, I think the big one here is Cedric VPG and what he looks like and how ready he is to go. I think center is kind of a position that gets pushed down in the draft and gets devalued and all that. I think there's a chance that he could be a day one starter or start at some point throughout this season. Um, so he's definitely making the roster. For me, then, it's are we keeping David Edwards and his salary, or are we comfortable with some of these guys as backups? Um, Travis Clayton. Have to do a little bit more work on that. I'm, I think with the International Pathways program, he can just stay on the active roster and not count against it. Um, not sure if that extends beyond the offseason into the regular season or if that's just an offseason thing. So kind of TBD on that. Um, and then I would say kind of just the biggest surprise cuts for me here. Richard Garage, I think, was interesting and looked pretty good in some of the action that we've seen from him. Um, but I think we saw confidence emerge from the Bills between um, Ryan Vandemark and Elk Anderson as kind of like those, those tertiary um backup options and then bring in Lyle Collins I think he's immediately you know your first guy off the bench swing tackle um, and he's also somebody the Bills have had their eye on for a while we have Spencer Brown's contract coming up he's dealt with um, not just injuries but like serious injuries back injuries um, so is that something where we're like you know, let's see what happens and where Spencer Brown's contract value is going, all that. Um, Lyle Collins, obviously somebody that's dealt with a lot of injuries himself. Um, so I think that one's interesting to watch. And then Tommy Doyle probably being my my biggest surprise cut here. And, you know, this is nothing against him as a player. I think this is just kind of a logistics decision. Um, obviously invested a, a fifth round pick in him, um, but has finished the last two years with, you know, serious season ending knee injuries. Um, I, I feel like I don't know any more about Tommy Doyle as a player than I did three years ago. Um, and for me, that just gets kind of, it gets concerning to count on that player for anything when we have some of these new faces coming in that that are unknowns. Um, obviously, 
the team, the organization is going to have more information on Tommy Doyle. They see him more. They see him in practice, all that. Where I stand right now, I, I'm three years into Tommy Doyle and I, I haven't, I haven't gotten any new information that I haven't had, um, to make me feel better about him being on the roster. And I'll kind of contradict myself here. I actually do have more information and I'll say he's a dog. You know, the, the Miami game where everybody was dehydrated and coming in and out of the lineup, he finished that game with a torn ACL. Give him props for that. Um, but also some lovely fire trucks going by. Uh, but with that, we haven't been able to see him in game action. Um, and I think, I think the fifth round is a reasonable place to, to find a developmental starter, um, against the offensive line, just the, the path to it. And, you know, drafting new offensive linemen in the later rounds. Um, I think that just kind of marked a turning of a page for me with Tommy Doyle and wish him all the best. I just don't see a path um, to him making this roster. Um, So that's going to wrap it up on the offensive side of the ball. Um, Let me know what you think. Let me know if I'm, if you think I'm totally off base on some of these players, um, what you would do differently. I think the offensive side of the ball is kind of returning a lot of players. We saw a lot of key losses on the defensive side of the ball. Um, so I think there's a little bit more room for debate on the defensive side of the ball. Um, but wide receiver, offensive line, obviously a ton of numbers at those positions. Um, so drop a comment. Let me know what you think about some of these cuts I've made. Um, like I said, next week we're going to move into, you know, wrapping up the 53-man roster, rounding out the numbers with the defensive side of the ball, and then kind of moving into a positional review slash assessment of where I think we're at right now and as we move through the offseason, where I think we can tinker with the roster a little bit to uh, get the best version of the of the 2024 25 Buffalo Bills. Um, so make sure you're you're subscribed. I do ask that you like, share, tell a friend about the show if you're enjoying it. Um, check out other shows on the Fanbase Network. Tons of great stuff out there, like I said. And um, I am going to be publishing an article on this as well on the website if you want to get a little bit more insight into, you know, each of these players. You know, obviously, try to keep the show around a half an hour. It's hard to dive into every player who I'm firing. Um, so check out the article if you want a little bit more information. It'll be on wanderingbuff.com. I thank you for tuning in today, and we will see you next week for the defensive side of the ball. As always, go Bills. Go Bills.